Kristen Neidlein. I'm the local coordinator for the Stevens Point Area League of Women Voters, and we are co-sponsoring this morning's program with the Rapids League of Women Voters. But before we get started, I want to uh, say that for the Stevens Point group, this is our first <laughs> memorial public forum in honor of one of our lifelong members, in fact, one of our founding members, Maxine Barras. Many of you knew Maxine and Lee Barras in the community. And um, Maxine's son, Michael, and his wife, Mary, are here this morning to join us. So we're very glad to have them with us. So this program is in honor of Maxine. She not only was a founding member of the Stevens Point League of Women Voters, she also was a founding member of another league in Emporia, Kansas. So she was a very important community activist and a lovely woman, and we want to do this in her memory. And I'd like to introduce Gloria uh, Kubishak, and she is from Wisconsin Rapids, and she'll introduce our speaker this morning. Thank you, Christine. And thank you, Professor Miller. I'm Gloria Kubishak from the Wisconsin Rapids League. And we're very pleased to be able to co-sponsor with the Stevens Point League and offer this public forum on a very important topic. It's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Miller, who is a member of the political science department here at the University of Stevens Point. And besides his teaching assignments, Professor Miller is a prolific writer. For the past decade, he has been writing for the Wall Street Journal as a political science analyst. And um, his teaching assignments and the issues which he deals with include health issues, education policy, local and state government, US and foreign policies. So uh, a very wide range of expertise. And today he will speak to us on the healthcare crisis in our nation and whether or not that will bankrupt us. So with no further ado, <laughs> with no further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Professor Miller. And again, okay. thank you so much for <laughs> thank being you. here. Thank you. I always like to come to places that are uh, within three minutes from my house. <laughs> That helps. <laughs> that helps. Well, I've been, uh, been asked to talk about the um, issue of health care uh, and the problem of the health care. Uh, essentially, it's, it will be a crisis um, in, in terms of enduring the cost of it in, in, in terms of this. The cost, essentially, of health care will be affecting and is affecting uh, everyone. Uh, it's clearly affecting business. Uh, the businesses are having to pay greater and greater premiums uh, for health care. Uh, they're required, if they're over 50 uh, per people, they're required to have health care, provide health care under the Affordable Care Act or pay into a fund. Um, but if large businesses have been providing health care, uh, where you see the tail off in recent years have been smaller businesses and to some extent medium-sized businesses. Um, and I'm talking about real smaller businesses, not the, the, uh, the federal government's definition of small business is, is uh, 500 or less. And so when they talk about a lot of the jobs being created by small business, a lot of people are thinking about ones of 10 or 15 people, but they're talking about peop uh, businesses under 500. But I'm talking about smaller businesses that are under like 25. And those, those are less likely to have health care, provide health insurance. And under the Affordable Care Act, they're not required to. Anybody, any uh, business under 50 is not required to provide uh, health insurance. And so there, there's problems in terms of businesses. There's problems in terms of individuals in terms of health insurance. Because what's happening is that the cost of health insurance uh, to these individuals, to, to everybody, is going up. And not only uh, is the cost going up in terms of the uh, premiums for insurance, uh, but the fact is that more and more people are getting high deductibles. And these high deductible policies mean that the cost is being transferred to them. And so as a consequence, a lot of people had expected that the bankruptcies, the largest uh, cause of bankruptcies, is health care expenses. And a lot of people thought that that would uh, go away, or a lot of it would go away, if uh, once the Affordable Care Act goes into to being. Well, it will help. But one of the problems with, with, uh, with the insurance is that people are getting these high deductible policies. 
And as a result, the, the debt burden on these individuals, even with insurance, are extremely high. So we have the high deductible policies, uh, but also the co-payments. Uh, one case that I read about the other day in the newspaper uh, was an individual, or family actually, they had, they had health insurance. They actually had health insurance. And one of the problems was that he had a, a high deductible policy. And the deductible policy was $4,000. And he thought that he could easily you know, pick up the $4,000 if you know, there was a tragedy. And they were young, younger people. And uh, they would do the $4,000. But that would cost them less in premiums uh, for the health insurance policy. Well, the problem was that he hurt his back significantly and couldn't work in November of, la of uh, last year. And so consequently, there was a $4,000 deductible. Uh, but since it was November, you then have December, and then you have January. And January is a new deductible. So then he had $8,000 deductible plus co-payments. And so he has a very significant debt burden. And uh, this was uh, an article in the newspaper saying that even with the insurance, uh, people have insurance that these individuals are, are really being burdened uh, by this. The third thing is the economy in general. And the economy in general is having an effect. I mean, now we're up to about 17% of the uh, gross domestic product. And I'll show you the data. But the, the fact is that it's 17% of, uh, of, of the economy. And you've got to remember, the health industry is not an import industry or export industry, I should say. In other words, in, in effect, we're not exporting it to other countries. Uh, and so we're consuming it basically ourselves. So it's not bringing in money to the country. There is some people who do come here for health care, but it's a small, it's a small number. Um, so therefore, I mean, there are people uh, like in the uh, Rehabilitation Institute in Chicago, for example, which is, which is internationally known. There are people like from Saudi Arabia, some that have come here. And they're just paying it out of their pocket uh, from oil money. Uh, and, and there's some of those, those things. The King of Jordan comes here. The King of Jordan comes here. He goes to the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, I don't know what happened. His father went to the Mayo Clinic. But uh, maybe it's because his father died and he decided to try the Cleveland Clinic. So I don't know. He comes to the Cleveland Clinic. But, but, but that's a small percentage. So, so it, in effect, as it goes up, gross, nice, gross domestic product is all goods and services produced. So if one sector is taking more and more of, a, of the economy, what it is is a redistribution of income. And, and, and that's a, a problem. Um, and the question is, what is the gross domestic product it should be? Well, we don't know, but it's, it's certainly much more than any other country. And once you start getting up to 17 to 20 percent, that's, that's, you know, a fifth of the economy. And it's a significant, it's a significant issue. So let's take a look at some of the data. Unfortunately, uh, I thought maybe this wouldn't take place because we didn't have a projector, but fortunately, uh, it was right. <laughs> okay. This, if we want to find cheaper uh, health care, uh, this is one way of getting it. Uh, you, could, you could go to the airport and get a scan, and, 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 and you, could, you, you could find out exactly. We're, we're coming to that point. Uh, we're coming to that point. So you might as well uh, save some money. Uh, but one interesting issue is the U.S. actually uses less health care than many other countries in the world. Because we say, well, we spend more on health care, so therefore we're getting more health care. Well, in fact, is we're not. Uh, other parts of the world, other countries of the world, actually are getting more health care than, than in the United States. Now, not necessarily more is better. But if you look at the outcomes of health care, so some people say, well, OK, more is not better. The outcomes of health care are not as good in the United States as other countries. And, and this is especially true if you look at the disparities. We have much greater disparities than in many other, country, many other developed countries. And that is the, the poor, uh, racial disparities, and so forth in the United States are very, very significant. But even beyond racial disparities, our outcomes are not as good as many parts of the world. And there may be all kinds of reasons for that, uh, but the fact is that uh, if you look at, just look at uh, infant mortality, uh, it's an easy rate. 
uh, you look at infant mortality, we're way down in infant mortality uh, in, in the world. Uh, but you can look at a lot of other, other uh, uh, indices. But this one shows that, this shows the amount of health care. So this is uh, doctor consultations per person uh, in, in 2010. And you can just see where the United States uh, is. The United States is all the way down here. And uh, uh, Japan is, is, is the largest. The Japan is the largest. Uh, but not necessarily we should be at the top, but it just shows you that we're not getting more health care. So, so one of the things is, why is the cost up? One response is, we're getting more health care. Well, we're not getting more health care uh, than other countries. Our prices are high. And so this is, this, this is actually uh, two examples uh, having to do with heart. And one is uh, angioplasty. Uh, and angioplasty is where they go in and they clean out the artery and uh, often put a stent in. Uh, we've been doing it in the United States through the leg. The better one is through the wrist, uh, less bleeding. Uh, but anyway, but lots of angioplasties are done. Uh, and so, but just take a look at the cost of the angioplasties in the United States, which is the blue line, and the, and the uh, gray lines there, brownish gray lines there, are other countries. Uh, Switzerland, Australia, and, and Netherlands were the three closest. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are well over double that of Switzerland, for example, which is the closest one uh, to the United States. Uh, the second uh, one, the one on the right side, is coronary artery bypass surgery. And coronary artery bypass surgery in the United States averages $75,345. And that's a, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. Now, um, I did, um, this, is, this is a while ago, but I did an inventory of medical facilities in central Wisconsin. And uh, it was a while ago. I've forgotten how long ago it was. But it was, it was well over a decade ago. Uh, so it may have been two decades uh, ago. And it was for the Central Wisconsin Economic Research Bureau at that time. And at that time, so OK, it was 20 years ago. But, uh, but heart bypass surgery in our area was $10,000. <laughs> was $10,000, I remember. And the, now it's, uh, this is uh, 2013. The average in the United States is now 75,000. Uh, and so you can just see the change uh, that, that that's occurred. That's all in US dollars. Yeah, it's a translation to US dollars. Good point. Uh, it's in US dollars. Uh, since the Affordable Care Act, uh, one of the things that has occurred is that Medicare has a longer life. And so, so in a, a, a lot of people look at the Affordable Care Act, and we think about a lot of the things on the Affordable Care Act, like people under 26 can get insurance on their, on their uh, parents' policies. There can be no pre-existing conditions excluded, those kinds of things. But what people don't look at is the, effect, the effects of the Affordable Care Act on Medicare. It has a significant effect on Medicare, and that's not talked about very much. Uh, one of the things on Medicare it has done is it's provided a lot more services in Medicare. So when Medicare, for most of the time of Medicare, since 1965, uh, a physical was not included in Medicare. So if you wanted a physical each year, a well-person physical, uh, Medicare didn't pay. Then they introduced, not long ago, uh, a physical when you entered Medicare called Welcome to Medicare. Uh, they called it Welcome, yet you could have one. Uh, uh, welcome to Medicare. But now, it's, uh, now I, th I think what happens with Welcome to Medicare is if they find you're in bad shape, they send you to another country. So they can pay, they'll pay the cost. So I think that was the actual motive of the Welcome to Medicare, you know. They only keep the people who are healthy. But the, the, the fact is that uh, now, Medicare, now Medicare provides um, a yearly uh, physical. Uh, well, uh, well check uh, physical. Uh, it provides a lot of other things. All a lot of preventative services uh, are in Medicare. Anything in the preventative task force uh, has approved. Uh, Medicare pays for Medicare with no no copayments, with no copayments, and so it significantly uh, improved improved Medicare, uh, the Affordable Care Act in terms of services, but it also improved Medicare in terms of money. Uh, it made some adjustments to Medicare. 
And one of the major adjustments to Medicare that is not talked about, but I think could be one of the reasons that there's a Republican opposition to the Affordable Care Act is that there is a new tax in Medicare. And that tax is only for wealthy people. So it's people who, who are making over uh, family over $250,000 uh, once they receive Medicare. But th the thing is, it's not just an add-on tax, because Bush put an add-on tax to Medicare too, uh, but we for wealthier people. But this tax is the first one in Medicare or Social Security that also counts investment income, not just, not just uh, earned <laughs> income. And so that's the first time at investment income. And there's a number of uh, individuals, obviously, who are more wealthy, who make most of their money on investment income. And so they don't want this, this particular tax. And, and so that is actually in there. But the consequence of that is it has now increased the exhaustion of Medicare, which means zero, zero surplus. Medicare has been building a surplus. Only within the last couple of years have they, been, have they been reducing the surplus, cashing in the bonds, in other words. Um, and, but they still have a surplus in, in Medicare. But the question is, when is that surplus exhausted, which means there's zero surplus. Now, it doesn't mean they won't have any money, because people will still be paying in Medicare. And so they will still have money. Uh, that 72% of cost they will still be able to pay, even if nothing is done. But when will that surplus be exhausted? And the most recent trustees report was, uh, was last year, 2014, and it's now 2030. It's now 2030. So it's extended Medicare about 16 years, about 16 years. And so it's had an effect on, on, on Medicare. This just shows you the different trustees reports and exactly when, when the, uh, what they call the exhaustion of the surplus will occur. So it shows you the different ones. Okay. Now, one of the problems with, uh, with um, the question of health care, one of the problems with health care in terms of cost, uh, uh, basically, is that there, there are no controls on cost. That, that general controls on cost. That there are, there are some attempts to control costs, there's some cost incentives in the Affordable Care Act, but the bottom line is that there's no controls of cost, either market or government. So let's take a look at market first. And what we call this is market failure. That the market simply does not work. Now, now they don't control the the cost of my running shoes. Uh, nobody controls that. It's not needed. And the cost of my running shoes hasn't gone up you know, a great deal, especially if you take out uh, inflation. And, and you take out the fact that I usually buy them much, I run with it much longer than I'm supposed to. <laughs> but that's another story. <laughs> but that's because I'm cheap. But the fact is, <laughs> but, uh, but the fact is, that market doesn't work, because market normally would work to regulate cost in most, most things. And, but in this case, the market doesn't work. When people buy health care, they don't know the quality. People do not know the quality of what they're buying. When they go see a doctor, they don't know the quality of the doctor. They've heard from other people, from other sources, but that may not be accurate. Uh, you know, my favorite one also goes back a long time, but it was a surgeon in Baltimore. And everybody went to this guy. And everybody went to this guy, he was great. And I talked to some of the residents that were in surgery and they said he was terrible. <laughs> and the fact is he didn't have the latest techniques, uh, his patients were in the hospital longer, uh, they had more, more problems, and a lot of the residents did his surgery. But he had this reputation, but nobody knew it. Nobody knew it. And so it's very difficult. We're now getting a little information on hospitals. We're getting a little information on hospitals. Uh, we don't have much information on providers, but we're getting more information on hospitals. So in Wisconsin, for example, one, big th one important thing in hospitals is infection rates. And we're one of the few states that do not publish infection rates. And this was opposed by the Wisconsin Hospital Association. 
So you can't look up and look at uh, St. Clair's and, and, and Aspires and so forth and see what the infection rate is directly. However, the Medicare came in and, they, and there is in the web Medicare website called Medicare Compare. And you can go to Medicare Compare and in Medicare Compare, there's the infection rates because the federal government has required the hospitals to submit that information to it. So you could take a look at the infection rates of those hospitals. And so there's other things that you can compare as best as you can in hospitals, but a lot of people don't. So you go to a doctor and the doctor says, well, I go to this hospital and that's the hospital you go to. Uh, but even, even there, there, there are, there are some, in, some data that you can use. But on providers, there's very little. There is now beginning to be a little bit more data, but it's iffy. It's very difficult to measure this. It's iffy. For example, there's data out there that will be out there, and you can find some of it in the prescription patterns of physicians, of whether their prescription patterns are within the area of their, uh, their specialty. So if they're giving more um, uh, what's called innovative medicine, in other words, uh, non-generics, you can look at if they're giving more uh, narcotics uh, than other doctors in that specialty, you may you, you will have that information to make decisions. But those kinds of informations are very hard uh, to come by. Uh, so people don't know the quality. People don't know what the prices are. Uh, you know, when people go in to have their colonoscopy, do they know what their price is for that colonoscopy? And colonoscopies are expensive. And what we found is that where some of this information is made available, in California, for example, that information has to be made available. And that was about two years ago. And, and they have discovered that the cost of these procedures are radically different but the, down the street. One hospital, three blocks uh, away, it is radically different. Not just a little different, but radically different for the same procedure. And that it's not, it's not hooked in with, um, it's not hooked in with quality. Uh, it's not related to quality where I'm going to spend more and it's related to quality. The other thing is that several people have done it, but I heard one uh, a couple weeks ago in which they went out and they wanted to find out the price of, of, from a hospital, not the physician, but from the hospital, the price of delivering uh, a baby, an uncomplicated delivery of a baby. What would the hospital charge? Uh, for that. So they called a whole bunch of hospitals to get that information, and they couldn't. They wouldn't give it to them. And, and of the information they asked, the only thing they could get, and not from everybody, they said, was the cost of parking. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. They could get the cost of parking, but they couldn't get the cost. And it radically differs also among people because what they say their charges are, the only people who pay those charges are people who don't have insurance because all the insurance get discounts. And they don't want to tell you what the discounts are because they're proprietary. Uh, so they're not going to tell you what the discounts are. And so it's information you don't have. People want the best in healthcare. And so it isn't like we're running shoes. I don't need the best. If anybody's seen me running, you may say, you know, I've got shoes that are too, too much for what I need. But, but, but the fact is that you, you don't need that. You don't necessarily need that. With a car, people don't necessarily buy the best car, maybe. But the point is, with health care, people don't say, well, that's a nice knee, but that's a too costly knee. I'll get a cheaper knee. <laughs> if you have a used one, <laughs> haven't used it very much. And so people don't do that. Uh, so people want, want, the, want the best uh, in, in that area. And people don't make choices. People don't make choices. Uh, your physician makes the choice in most cases. Uh, you go in for blood tests. Do you tell your doctor what blood tests to run and say, do you really need this blood test? No, you don't do that. The doctor puts down the blood test. And, uh, and at Marshfield, for example, typically it's done even before you see the doctor. So the doctors put in those blood tests, and so you, so, so, so you go to the lab and you don't know what test that they've ordered. And they may be ordering some expensive test, they may be ordering way more tests than, than are needed, and, and so forth. Uh, and, but the point is, you don't choose. You're not really choosing in, the, in that way. But in, in a market, uh, you choose. So it's really, the market mechanism uh, doesn't work in, in, in the area of healthcare. Um, 
The other thing I should point out before I get the reasons is there is, there is very little control over the cost of health care by government. So if the market doesn't work, government comes in to do regulations. So the big one recently is net neutrality. And so there's a question of, there's a fear that net neutrality, which has to do with, with, with the internet, that, that they're going to differentiate how fast you get on the internet by how much you pay, essentially. And that's a fear. So the Federal Communications Commission on uh, Thursday uh, has indicated that it will be a utility and they will have a net neutrality rule. But the point is like that, as well as your electric rates and so forth, are, are regulated, are regulated. There are, there are no regulations here. There are no regulations here. So, so that's a problem. So you don't, have the, you don't have the market regulating it. And on the other hand, you do not have the regulation of, um, of, of uh, government. Now, we have had some in some places. For example, some places actually regulate, for example, the cost of hospitals. And so we had this in Wisconsin. We had a hospital rate commission. And the hospital rate commission really worked. And as a matter of fact, the, the, it was given as a case study in some books. And it was on Wisconsin about this hospital rate commission. Well, it disappeared. And uh, this was not renewed under Governor Thompson. And we have no hospital rate commission. Uh, but, but you could do it. The other one is a certificate of need. And certificate of need was required. All states had to have a certificate of need. So if you're building something new, particularly a hospital, building a new hospital, or you're, or you're like Marshfield is building, a, this may be building, a tertiary care center, a uh, mini hospital, uh, and, or buying very expensive equipment, you had to get approval so that there wouldn't be duplication uh, of, of equipment. And so that's what we had. Well, in the early 90s, early 80s, Reagan uh, eliminated that as a federal requirement. And so that's no longer a federal requirement. Some states kept that, other states didn't. Some states still have certificate of need. And we do not in Wisconsin. Uh, we got rid of ours in Wisconsin. And so there has been a building boom in Wisconsin of hospitals. Uh, you know, there was a hospital built in Watertown, I think it was Aurora's Hospital in Watertown, and there was another hospital in Watertown that said they don't need them. What do they need them for? Uh, but we've had a building boom. Some people claim that St. Clair's wasn't needed uh, in, in our community. Uh, so there's been a lot of building boom and a acquisition of very high expensive equipment. So some of the reasons for cost increases are, this is just some of the reasons, are clearly technology. Uh, one reason driving is technology. MRIs, for example, are expensive. You have an MRI in a knee in the United States, it's about, maybe about $1,500. You have it in Japan, it's 90. It's 90 in Japan. And, but, the, but a lot of high-tech equipment is expensive. Now, unlike other areas where new technology and equipment has actually lowered the price, look at computers how much new, uh, new technology and computers have actually lowered the price, this has not occurred in medicine. This has not occurred yet in medicine. And so it, it adds to the cost. It adds to the cost. There's duplication of facilities and equipment. That's, uh, I, I already mentioned that. And new and in-use use prescriptions. And prescriptions, interesting enough overall, as I will show, have actually fallen in terms of cost. And the reason is, is because 85% of prescriptions are now generic. 85% are generic, which are, which, which, which are cheaper. But with prescriptions, there's more, there's more uh, medications that are coming out and more uses of existing medications. So people are taking many more drugs. And this, is, this adds to the cost. And what's coming is, it's already here, but it's, it's going to expand is biologics. And the biologics, the biologics are very expensive. And so, and so we already have the $1,000 pill. And that's a pill for uh, hepatitis C. And that's, expect, that's expected to increase these biologics. Now, there will be probably not many generics of these biologics because they're hard to make and the requirements are greater. 
there, is, there are virtually no requirements for generics. So in other words, if you want to produce a generic pill and you say it's similar to the, or, or the same as, same ingredients as the uh, brand name is actually, it's called the innovative drug, the fact is you can do it as long as the patent has, has run out. The, uh, there is very little testing of that drug. But because of biologics, biologics will not be the equivalent. My biologics are being referred to as biological similars. And so they will not work exactly the same. And so therefore, at least right now, the prices of the ones that are coming out are very high of the, of the, of the new drugs. Uh, there's some expectation now, because uh, there was a change in, in the rule uh, a couple weeks ago, or a couple months ago, I guess it was a couple months ago, that there could be some uh, essentially generic biologics, but that hasn't taken place yet. So uh, there, there are one or two in Europe. Um, so, but anyway, but all of this leads to increased cost, increased cost. Specialization certainly increases the cost. We have much more specialized health care now. I mean, the specialization not only leads the, the traditional specialization, such as orthopedics, uh, cardiology, but now we have subspecialization of that, and they tend to be more expensive. So rather than going to the, the, going to the cardiologist, you go to the electrophysiologist. Uh, which is uh, if you're having problems with heart rhythm, uh, that kind of thing, electrical aspect, they're the electricians of the heart. Uh, and so you add all this up in orthopedics that only do, orth orthopods that only do hands and, and, or, or adult replacement therapy. All of that increases costs. Uh, defensive medicine is, is one. This is where uh, physicians uh, are doing things uh, in case of malpractice. And the problem is nobody knows what's defensive and what's not. So you talked about why did you run that, that CT scan, for example, somebody who hit their head. Uh, some doctors will say, well, it was absolutely necessary. And other ones will say, well, we just wanted to make sure there was no bleeding there. Well, in the old days, they didn't do that. In the old days, if you went in the emergency room, they looked at your eyes, they see if you were all right, they didn't do a CT scan. But right now, there was a case in, uh, in uh, Georgetown and it was a person came in, they did that, I think they did an x-ray, and they didn't see anything, person went home, and the person died. And so the question was that they, had, they missed the, the, the bleeding. And they said, was there a CT scan available? Well, yes. Then the question is, well, why didn't you use it? Well, because you just don't do it on everybody. I mean, not only is it expensive, but it's a lot of radiation. Uh, or breast biopsies. Um, and and that's, these are questions that are raised. And so what you do is you do it on everybody. And that becomes, uh, and, 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 and those tests all add up in terms of cost, uh, certainly. Uh, malpractice insurance costs have gone up, although uh, actual malpractice hasn't gone up in terms of payouts. Uh, but insurance costs have gone up. Uh, we've seen some eras in which they went up a lot. Now they're sort of more level. But that's uh, something we do have. Uh, physician compensation has increased. increased. Uh, if you, if you can measure physician compensation in a lot of ways. Uh, the, the gross amount that physicians make is probably not the easiest way to get the handle on it. But if you look at what physicians make versus the average worker, you get a ratio there. Now, they're, they're obviously going to make more. But the question is, has that ratio been widening? And they have been. And they have been. Now, maybe that's going to be leveling off. Some people suggest it is. Uh, as more and more physicians uh, begin working for large medical institutions, we're a little bit different here in central Wisconsin, probably in a lot of ways. But, uh, but one way is that the physicians here have been working for medical institutions, whether it's ministry or, or Marshall. But that's not true around the country. Around the country, a lot of physicians are in smaller practices. It may be three internists or, or something like that in that practice. Well, those practices are being bought out significantly, have been bought out by the larger medical institutions. So they are getting a salary and maybe with some incentive pay rather than uh, being on their own. And that uh, will reduce cost a little bit because the salary probably is a little less than maybe they can make on their own. Of course, they don't have to worry about running an office. Uh, and they tend to have more regular hours, which younger physicians want. Uh, younger physicians coming out uh, don't want to be on call, you know, 24 hours a day. And that used to be, came with the territory, but not anymore. 
The fact is, that's one of the first things that they typically ask uh, an institution when they're interviewed. Well, how often do I have to be on call? And, um, and they don't want to be there. So they're willing to take a bit of a lower pay uh, for, the, for the less call. Uh, issue. So, but still, there are there are increases. If you're a heart surgeon and you come out as a heart surgeon, you should be making probably about a million dollars a year. And we, right now, gastroenterologists, I'd say about four hundred thousand for, for for a gastro. Uh, that's why fewer people in, from from U.S. medical schools uh, go into primary care, family practice, internal medicine, pediatrics. And, and so what's happening is we're recruiting people from international medical schools here, and they, some of those people are willing to go into primary care because you have to do a residency in the United States, and those residencies are available. Residencies in areas like surgery and so forth are much less available. So you'll find uh, there are doctors, uh, actually in central Wisconsin, who are foreign doctors from other medical schools who did residencies like in ear, nose, and throat but they're practicing primary care here. And you may say, well, why? Did they get tired of ear, nose, and throat? Uh, no, it was because they couldn't get a residency in the United States in that area, and they wanted to come to the United States. Um, and so many, uh, many people in the United States are going into these uh, higher price uh, specialties, and that tends to be about 75%. The 25% go into primary care right now. Um, cost of cost containment, which is another problem. You, you, and I point this out, I don't know too many people point this out, but it's true. The fact is, if you're going to contain the cost and have some mechanism to contain the cost, that costs money. <laughs> that, in effect, costs money. So one aspect of cost containment is that if you go into, if you're admitted to a hospital, your insurance, custom, insurance company must give approval, or Medicare must give approval, or who's ever, Medicare doesn't actually do it, it's an insurance company that works for Medicare. And so they must give approval. The insurance company, or often the insurance company, has a, a company that does it for the insurance company. But somebody's got to give approval. Well, if somebody's giving approval, somebody's got to make a call to the insurance company. Somebody's got to call back and give the approval. All that costs money. And so there's a cost to cost containment. And when, you go in, and when you go into the hospital, now there is somebody who's a planner. They call them different things, discharge planner or whatever. And what they do is they then basically say, what is your plan of treatment? What is your plan of treatment? In the old days, the doctor decided when you were to release from the hospital. And so there was, why are they doing this? To try to contain costs. To try to contain costs. Well, that costs money. That, in effect, costs money. Uh, upcoding. This is a problem that clearly occurs. That clearly occurs. Uh, I remember on the day, it was, it was strange. It was on the day that I had the executive director of Marshfield Clinic in my class, a couple of executive directors ago, not the girl. And anyway, in my class, and this person was saying, there's no upcoding. There was no upcoding that, that occurs, basically, he said. Well, that day, in the Wall Street Journal, in the left-hand column, there was an article about upcoding, <laughs> which means that they put a code that is higher than, than uh, what your condition is. Uh, and so that's, that's the code that they put in. And one hospital firm, I always found this strange, they were, they were found guilty. But the hospital, there was a hospital, it was a hospital chain. They kept two sets of books. And why would anybody keep two sets of books? <laughs> so they, they kept two sets, of course the federal government found it and they were, they were, they were fine. But, 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 but upcoding tends to occur. If it's a simple fracture, they put a complex fracture and they used a code for, for, for that. And there are firms that do this, by the way. They, they will, will never say they're upcoding. These firms will never say they're upcoding because it's illegal. What they say is they're optimizing your codes. <laughs> and so they're brought into hospitals in particular and to optimize the codes, to make sure you're charging the right codes and you're getting as much money uh, as you're, you're, you're due. Uh, fraud, waste, and abuse does occur. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of it. There's a lot of it. Waste and abuse becomes more difficult. Fraud is easier uh, to look at, and this is where people bill for patients that don't exist. A lot of this, there's some physicians, there's, uh, the Obama administration has, has had a major campaign against this, and there's a number of physicians actually who have been uh, arrested and charged with this. Um, but, but a lot of this is not so much physicians, but a lot of the other aspects of, of health care. And, and those aspects you know, would include in, uh, durable medical equipment and all that, kind of, all that kind of stuff. Now, notice that on TV, you no longer see ads 
for that ride around. Remember, they were pushing that ride around, and you can get it from Medicare, uh, and Medicare will pay for that ride around. That's gone from TV because the federal government went after them. That was a fraud. Uh, and that was a fraud. So, so there's no more ride arounds. They've got some other stuff, but uh, they're not pushing that. And maybe other companies, I don't know. Uh, third party payments is a problem, that the fact is that the person who's getting the treatment is not paying. And so the person basically has less of a concern. They have less skin in the game uh, for this. And people see things on their bill that they didn't get, and they you know, think they challenge it. Uh, they could, but, but if their insurance company is paying for it, they say, well, I'm not paying for it. I'm not going to worry about it. You know, and it's hard to read the bills anyway. Uh, but third party payment, uh, but you, if you buy the shoes, you're not, there's no third party payment. Uh, increase in chronic diseases, that's, that's clearly true, diabetes, uh, these are costly. Um, and so there's an increase uh, there. Uh, also people are getting older, so there's an increase in chronic diseases. But generally, um, there has been an increase. Diabetes, uh, type 2 for example, had, which used to be just uh, older people with type 2, are now being found in younger people, uh, type 2 diabetes. And anyway, um, that's, that's a costly thing. Uh, people are living longer, which leads to higher medical expenses. And uh, people, people uh, are living. Uh, there's a couple people who died recently. The one guy, a famous uh, trader, and he came in and he died. He was, what, 107. Uh, but he still came in uh, three days a week. I don't know why he wasn't coming in five days a week, a shirt. <laughs> but, but he was still coming in three days a week. <laughs> three days a week uh, to work. Uh, Medicare reform uh, to try to contain cost. Uh, the trust fund is paid out of the payroll tax, so people who are working are paying for Part A, for Part A. But the problem with Medicare is, in terms of going broke, is it's Part A, not Part B, not Part B. Part B pays physicians and uh, like labs, outpatient stuff, and so it's Part A which is the real is, is the real problem because that's a trust fund. And that is paid for by individuals who are working. That's what's taken off of, of the check. When it says Medicare, it all goes into A, not into B. B is premiums, and uh, now the federal government pays out of general taxes 75% of it. It used to fluctuate. Uh, but in beginning in 97, it was established as 75%. But in fact is that that will not go broke, technically. People may object to it, uh, but whatever the cost of that is, the premiums automatically go up as well as the amount coming from the federal government. Now, because medical inflation has been tamed lately, the premiums have not gone up, interestingly enough. That's the reason the premiums haven't gone up, because the inflation has been tamed in the last couple, the last couple years. So there's been very uh, uh, low, well, there was none last year, uh, increase in the premium, which is the first time that, that has occurred. But part A is the problem. And you can look at increased cost of hospital care, which is the real big one. Uh, intensive services are very expensive, and even low intensive services are expensive per day. Uh, even low, even we're not getting much, you're just in the hospital room. Uh, that's still expensive. That's, that, that is still expensive. Um, but one big problem of hospital care is not only the cost is, it's a declining workers per beneficiary that we have, we actually have a population bust in the United States. And so in effect, there are fewer and fewer people that are in the workforce uh, in the United States per beneficiary. And it's about three to one now. It used to be much more, it was like five to one. And so it will be eventually two to one. And so the only increase in the population is actually immigration, is actually immigration. The natural increase is actually below replacement level. But because of that, the fact is that these individuals are paying in because they're working, and there's fewer people paying in. There's fewer people paying in, and more beneficiaries relative to that. Uh, some Medicare pre uh, reforms, and I point out some of the key Medicare reforms to try to keep Medicare um, operating, is one big one is to increase the age of 67. To increase the age of 67. Uh, uh, the Social Security has increased to 67. That was done in the early 1980s, a slow rise to 67. So currently it's about 66 for full, medic, full Social Security. But Medicare was the same as Social Security. 
but it's not now for full social, full social security. You can get early social security at 62. But at full social security, so what happens is that the, uh, some people say that Medicare should also increase. But the problem of doing that is you're making the situation worse because you're getting more and more people who are not covered. People have argued they should go the other way, and they've called, they've called that Medicare for all, for example. Uh, but uh, the age, some people say, should, should be 67. Uh, increased Medicare, oh, the other problem moving from 65 to 67, I should mention, is those people who are 65 under, under Part B are paying a premium in Part B, but they're getting less services. And so, in effect, it helps out Part B that younger people, or younger, older people, I should say, that those individuals, I mean people 65, 66, and 67, are less likely to be using medical, uh, a, high, a lot of medical facilities versus somebody who is, let's say, in their 80s. And so what you're doing is you're taking out actuarially a group who would be paying a premium and not using uh, as much. And so that would cause problems with, with Part B in terms of cost that would rapidly uh, increase. Uh, increase Medicare taxes and premiums, well, you could do that. Uh, the problem of doing that is people are against taxes. Uh, and it's hard, hard to do that. Uh, Medicare taxes uh, have not gone up. The percentage has not gone up. What's going up is it used to be the same ceiling as Social Security, then it was higher than Social Security, and now there is no ceiling on Medicare taxes. Um, but the, the, the point is that those taxes could be. We could change the reimbursement methods, uh, and there's a lot of work in trying to do this. This is what people are looking at, changing the reimbursement methods. And there are several experiments now. And because we now pay fee for service for, for Part B. Uh, we, we've changed Medicare reimbursement for both. For Part A, they now get a bundled payment. For Part A, hospitals get a bundled payment. In other words, based upon your diagnosis. But the Part B still pays fee for service in most cases, unless you're um, uh, a part of uh, Part C, which where they pay per person. Um, and that would be like Avocare uh, at, a, at a security. Um, but, but most people, the largest number of people, get fee for service. So you go to the doctor, whatever the services, uh, um, amount is paid out. Now, we have now controlled that amount. That's true. We've controlled that amount since 93. But the, 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 how much the federal government will pay, they used to pay customary and usual fees. But now the amount is controlled. But still, the more services you get, the more is, is, is made by the provider. And so they're talking about changing that. And one clear one would be uh, episode of illness. And so pay it to treat you a bundled payment for that illness, for that illness. And there's experiments uh, now taking place in that. Uh, this one uh, is weird. And that is somebody who had nothing else to do decided to pay for physician training through Medicare. <laughs> So uh, hospitals that are, that are uh, teaching hospitals uh, actually get a higher Medicare reimbursement. And that Medicare reimbursement is actually the pay for the training of future doctors uh, in their residencies. And the question is, why? You know, uh, uh, this is a big, big issue. In other words, why is it coming out of Medicare? You know, they, not that they shouldn't be government money in that, but why is it coming out of Medicare? Uh, and people have recommended that a, a lot, to remove that from Medicare, uh, the physician training costs. Increase deductibles and co-payments, you certainly can do. Uh, people are not going to like it, but our deductible for Medicare is pretty low. The Medicare deductible uh, has increased just a bit over the years. Uh, right now, the co-payment is 20%. You can balance bill uh, a bit, but other than that, it's 20%. So Medicare pays 80%. They could reduce it to 75%. I mean, it's another way of dealing with Medicare. Uh, the other one is, is, is Ryan's, and that's the voucher plan or premium support. And this would be do away with Medicare, essentially. That you would get a, a, an amount that you can then go out, a voucher, and buy private insurance. Buy private insurance. The problem is it's more expensive. It's much more expensive, and, you're, and, and some people are not going to be able to afford it because they would have to put in a lot more money than they would get out of, get out of the voucher. You also got to remember that in private insurance, the administrative cost has been about 28%. With Medicare, the administrative cost is about 3%. <laughs> uh, 
is about 3% on Medicare. And it's a little bit more for Medicaid because of the administrative cost for Medicaid. But it's nothing like 28%. It's not nothing like 28%. Uh, but you were talking about marketing and administrative costs and things like that. Yeah, uh, yeah. How about, how about uh, as far as the premium being based on the grouping, if you're in private insurance, uh, it's a group, yeah, it's a group policy, right. Well, where a lot of people have group policy versus an individual. So, but if you went from Medi Medicare, it's based on how large of a group versus private insurance. Oh, yeah, sure. It would be go from, go from a group to, to there would be individual policies, most likely. They, they, they would be selling you because you wouldn't be in a group. So, if you have pre, -ex pre existing conditions, you're able to be. No, there still would be no pre existing conditions. Well, it would uh, cover it, but wouldn't that affect the rate? Oh, yeah, it would affect the rate because the insurance companies would be, right now, the only thing the insurance companies are selling to Medicare is Medicare supplements. And so, and so they don't have to take the full cost of the, but in this case, they would have to take the full cost. Right, right, right. So the insurance policies would be, would be higher. Would, would, yeah, they would, be, they would be higher than they are. Nobody knows exactly, I mean, because it's, it's really iffy uh, what, it, what the cost were. Like, they, they overpriced. The, the ones on the Affordable Care Act, those that had participated in the Affordable Care Act on the exchanges. And many insurance companies had overpriced it because they didn't want to underprice it for fear that they would be holding the bag. And so with the pre-existing conditions, they were worried, so they've overpriced it. So nationally, we find that in this coming, the, the, or the year we just went through where people picked it, actually nationally the prices fell. Nationally, the prices fell. Now, some places they went up, that's true. But I mean, if you look at all nationally, actually the prices uh, fell a bit. Okay, moving on, just a few other things. Healthcare spending, uh, and this uh, shows healthcare spending, the increases. Let's see if I can go through. But this is a total healthcare spending. Now, now uh, this is a chart uh, that I just got actually from, from Kaiser. And the fact is that you can see here that the spending, which is total national health care spending, how it's going up. The, the blue line is in constant dollars. Blue, blue line is in constant dollars. So, so you don't have to worry, it takes out inflation. And, and the other one, that's why they come together, because it's using 2013 constant dollars. So, so, but the point is, the blue line shows how it's increased since 1970. The 1970. That is pretty close to a linear increase. Uh, I mean, that, uh, how, how much it's going up uh, since 1970, uh, health care uh, expenditures. And that's what's, that's, that's what's happening. Health care is a percentage of the gross domestic product that was also going up, and it's now about 17%. It's now around 17%. And people were concerned about it. Uh, back in 1970, it was 7%. It was 7% of gross domestic product in 1970. Uh, but now it's 17% of gross domestic product. And by the way, in many communities, the, particularly the hospital, is the biggest employer in the community. Uh, so there, there's a major issue here. We've had some slowing in recent times. Some of this is because of the Affordable Care Act. Some of this could be because of the Great Recession, which wasn't so great. Uh, <laughs> but the, the fact is that we think some of this could be the Affordable Care Act, only because the effects of the Great Recession have sort of dissipated now. I mean, we've slowly, we are increasing getting approved, and we still see uh, the reduction, but it's hard to disentangle uh, those things. Uh, hospital spending continues to increase. Uh, that's the big one. The big one is the hospitals. Where's my chart? But anyway, this is average annual health insurance premiums, just to show you. And this is the insurance premiums, but you can look at the workers' contribution between 2004 and uh, 2014. The workers' contributions increased 81%. The total premium increased 69%. And that's a 10-year period. That's in a 10-year period. <laughs> At the university here, we have seen this. I, I did the thing for the university some time ago uh, about this, and I had the premiums that are charged uh, by the insurance companies that the university deal, I mean, the university here, it's state. But, but in our area, those universities, and it shows the same thing. It shows this rapid increase of this premium in, in, over the last 10, 10, 10 years. Uh, but this is the national data uh, shows that. Uh, this is the percentage of covered workers employed in a plan with a general NO. These are ones with at least a thousand dollar deductible. So it shows, what it shows is if you look at uh, all firms, the top one, it shows all firms 
They're, is that the all firm? No, it's a small firm. All firms are the are the blue in the in the in the in the, in the, in the middle. It's all firms. But 41 percent uh, to 2014 had at least a thousand dollar deductible. At least a thousand dollar deductible. Uh, but it shows you that the deductible is going up, and, uh, and of course, a lot more for smaller firms, which is the top one, and a little less for the uh, larger firms. Uh, here, here's the healthcare dollar. Uh, this is one that Kaiser did. I, I've done my own. Uh, they weren't as neat as this, but <laughs> they, they, they were a pot. But anyway, this is the current one, and it, and and it shows it, what it was shown all the time is that hospitals are the big big uh, money. So if you're looking for where cost cutting can be is, the first place to look is where the money is, and that's the hospitals. The hospitals are 34% of the healthcare, and that's been pretty consistent. What has increased, I always point out, is physicians and clinics. That's actually increased, it's 21%. But I've been doing this for 75 years, and over 75 years, I have seen that figure increase. That's the one I noticed that has increased is the physician one. Gradually, it's increased. But the hospital one has consistently been the high one. The hospital, uh, the, the, the uh, prescriptions are about 10%. It's been around there, 8, 10% uh, prescriptions. Most people think it's more because more comes from out of pocket uh, than, 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 the, than the other ones. Uh, but anyway, this is the, uh, this is, this is the cost. Uh, slowing growth of Medicare, I mentioned. Uh, this is the, what I just mentioned earlier. So go through this a little quickly, and that is that prescription uh, prices are down and quantities of taking are up. Uh, actually, I showed this in class and somebody asked me, uh, I have no idea, why the increased jump in 97, around 97, 98. We did have uh, a change in Medicare in that, in that era. This was the Balanced Budget Act of 97, but I'm not exactly sure why that would have affected prescription use. I, I don't know. The prescription drug benefit, I, I wouldn't be surprised, is right here. Is right here. Because that was 2006. This is when they add the prescription drug benefit to Medicare, Medicare Part D. But the other one, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what that was, uh, that, that increase. Anyway, so I, the last thing, and then, and then we, how much time do we have? Okay, I just want to take, so I, want, I want to leave time for questions. But one thing I just want to show you is, since we're talking about cost, I want to show you Wisconsin. And I want to show you this big thing about the Medicare, ex, the Medicaid expansion in, in, in terms of that. Because this is costing Wisconsin a lot of money, uh, not taking the Medicaid uh, expansion here. What we did was the Walker administration reduced we, in Wisconsin, it was 200% of the federal poverty line. The federal poverty line is fairly low. Uh, a lot of people think it's way too low. And as a matter of fact, there's another one uh, that is out there measuring poverty because of this. This was done by a person in the uh, Social Security Administration in the 1950s. And what they did, what she did was, she studied consumption patterns. And what she found was consumption patterns were three times the cost of food, that people needed three. So what it is is, it is a budget basket of food, food triple. But by the time you get to now, that, is, that, leads, that leads to be pretty, pretty low. So you can look at a poverty line of, a, and they have a different size families. So a single person would be 11,670. That's small, even for a single person, uh, the amount. But a family of four, the federal poverty line is uh, 23,850. Uh, that, that is low. Uh, when you think about uh, all the things that people have to, have to pay, pay out of that. And so uh, the fact is, what Walker did was, he, we, in Wisconsin, it was 200% of the po po poverty line. And many programs are a percentage greater than 100%, realizing that it's so low the federal poverty line. So we were 200% for quite a long time. We've been 200%. Well, he reduced the eligibility to 100% of the federal poverty line. Uh, and so you can see the, differ the difference. OK, the expansion where the federal government would pay is 133% of the federal, federal poverty line. And so if you look at that, it's really 100. I've, I've got it there. 
It's really confusing. It's really 133, but it's, but it's real, well, technically 133, I should say, but really 138%. Because there's a certain amount, that 5% that's disregarded when they, count, when they count the money, how much you make. So it's really 138% of the poverty line. So uh, the Medicare expansion is between 100 and 138%. That's what's considered a Medicare expansion. The federal government is picking up 100% of that. They're picking up 100% of that. Then that will be reduced from 100% to 90% over a 10-year period. Okay. So the federal government would be paying it. Uh, the current federal match for Wisconsin is about 58, 59%. It's about 50, it fluctuates based upon the income of the state. So the federal government pays for our benefits 58, 59%. However, if we would expand the Medicare, it would pay 100% uh, right, right, right now. And, and, okay, so that is, um, uh, so what he did was he reduced it from 200 uh, to 100, 100 uh, uh, percent. Uh, I should mention that in, that that's been estimated currently uh, at 134 uh, um, uh, million dollars, 134 million dollars, Wisconsin would not be getting, uh, or not is not getting. No, what did I just say? 100. No, it's 334 million. 334 million. The cut to the UW system is 300 million. So it's more than the entire cut to the UW system. Uh, which is a major cut. So 345. So, so anyway, who benefits, uh, uh, who would be benefiting from uh, expansion of Medicare would be those receiving the benefits. But the Wisconsin taxpayer would also benefit because there would be more Wisconsin costs covered. And the fact is your tax money that you're paying now is going to other states. It's going to other states. So Wisconsin has always been what we call a donor state. The fact is that, that we are getting less money back in Wisconsin than we pay out in taxes. And, and in the fact is, you're paying for the Medicaid in other states. And uh, that money would come back to, to Wisconsin. Wisconsin providers very much want this. Because what happens is that, that they're seeing people who are not insured, especially hospitals and emergency rooms. Uh, technically, in emergency rooms, they're required to see anybody who shows up in the emergency room. And <laughs> if I hadn't lived there long enough, I'd think we were having some kind of tornado. But anyway, <laughs> but since we have it every Saturday, I guess we're probably not. <laughs> uh, but the fact is that uh, uh, hospital providers are, are, seeing, are seeing these individuals. And, and they have to be required to see them, stabilize them in the emergency room. Well, the fact is that they would be covered by Medicaid. So providers, the Wisconsin Hospital Association has been really pushing for the Medicaid expansion uh, because of this. And it's double problem in Wisconsin. Because not only this, but the federal government cut back, gives extra payments to hospitals that see a lot of uninsured people. So there's extra payments that go to these hospitals. And this has been going on for some time. But they cut back the extra payments. So, and the reason the federal government cut back the extra payments, because there's going to be more people covered under Medicaid. Well, in Wisconsin, there isn't. <laughs> uh, but that was, the, that was the aim. That was the aim there. Uh, and Wisconsin insured have to pay more because of the cost shifting. So all the people that they're seeing in the emergency room that have no, no, you know, no uh, insurance and no money, the fact is somebody's got to pay for that. So they're increasing other people's bills to pay for that. That's cost shifting. That is just a significant amount of cost shifting that occurs in medical care. So this is one reason your aspirin, if you're in the hospital, costs, you know, $20. The, the aspirin costs $20. Well, aspirin doesn't cost $20, even if, you, even if you put the person's salary in that had to deliver the aspirin. The fact is that it's cost shifting. What they're doing is they're using that as a cost shift, yeah. Oh, I'm sure there's people who have. I mean, I don't know if there's any statistics. But there, are, but there is a national studies of the effects of not having insurance. Uh, right, and I'm sure, I don't, I don't think we have that data. 
I don't think, and it probably it's probably too soon uh, as well. But there, but there are national data that have looked at uh, the impact of not having insurance on on, med, on, on um, uh, mortality and morbidity. Uh, so it has to affect Wisconsin. Uh, why not expand it? It's clearly an ideology against the Affordable Care Act. It, that's the only reason for expanding it. The go Governor Walker's argument has no ba has, ha is laughable. Uh, Governor, uh, what Walker says is the reason we're not expanding it because we can't trust the federal government to send us the money. Well, the federal government is, is first thing is if they stop sending the money, we can stop the program. It's just that simple. I mean, you know, you simply say, oh, well, we didn't get the money, we're going to stop the program uh, for one. But the second thing is. So what is he telling these people? He's telling these people to, to participate in the exchanges. And, and if they participate in the exchanges, they get a federal subsidy. Doesn't he worry about their money that they're getting as a federal subsidy? In, in that, in that, in that, so it's really not a reason. It's, it's, it's absolutely not a reason in that area. The other thing is he argues that federal government has already reneged on the money. This is the stupidest argument in the world. And that is the fact is he said the federal government has renewed, reneged. Federal government's never reneged on a cent, on a cent. Something did happen. Something did happen. What happened was that the federal government every year determines what the reimbursement, what the match rate is, what the match rate is. And there was a slight change in the match, match rate. And so the slight change in the match rate of the percentage it resulted in us getting slightly less money because the match rate was not as good uh, from one year to another. But it was really slight. It was less than 1% difference. It was, a, it was a decimal change. And that's actually what he's, he's keying off that they reneged. Well, they never reneged. There's never been a single dollar that the federal government has not given us. And if they don't have the money, they'll just print it. Yeah. What's the match rate based on? What? What's the match rate based on? Uh, income to state. Incomes Income of the state, yeah, wealth of the state. So the match rate, for example, for Mississippi uh, will, is, is higher than that of Wisconsin. Uh, and, and, and so it's based upon, it's based upon that. Uh, yeah? Well, one reason one assumes that hospitals are a high percentage is they have to make up for all these people who are coming in. That's why you got $20 aspirins and that increases. Right, price. right. Do we Some have any faith? that if we participated in this and the hospitals were getting more money, you know, from Medicare, Medicaid. Right. Do they have any faith that they would then lower all their prices? They wouldn't lower their prices, but probably that the increase would be less. <laughs> probably the increase would be less, unless you controlled hospitals, unless you had hospital, hospital control. Now, there's other things that are happening. There are other things that are happening. Uh, um, uh, this is just a thing of partial expansion, uh, but that's it. So I just wanted to let me. I just want to turn this thing off, and then I'll um, talk. Let's see. Don't turn it off. There. We go. No. It's, no, it's powering down. No. Um, uh, with regard to, with regard to uh, hospitals uh, and and current attempts. Uh, one attempt at uh, trying to control the cost of hospitals has to do with incentives. And so under the Affordable Care Act, there's not a direct control of the cost, but there's incentives to try to reduce uh, those costs. And one of, the, one of the incentives is, and improve quality, one of the big incentives is, is quality of care. And so quality of care is being measured in several ways, one of which is, uh, uh, which is readmission rates. And so if somebody has to be readmitted to the hospital, and especially for infections, they've got a hospital-acquired infections, if there's a lot of those people, that reduces the Medicare reimbursement to that hospital. And so there is a stick uh, that they're using. And so hospitals don't want that. If they, if they have low rates, for example, of infections and low rates of readmission, then they actually get a little bit more. Uh, in terms of reimbursement for Medicare. So they're using a carrot and stick around the, the Medicare, uh, around the Medicare uh, reimbursement rate. Now the strange thing is, this is, I, I just don't understand this. 
The fact is that because they put in the infection rates, infection rates around the country have plummeted. They have significantly dropped. And you look at these infection rates, they are really dropping and they're putting in all kinds of procedures and, and things like that. My question is, didn't they know <laughs> before Medicare you know, tied it to the money? They should have been working to get down their infection rates to begin with. But the fact is that they drop. And so it's an interesting question. In, Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania decided a couple years ago, it was four years ago or something like that, they were publishing their infection rates. And so they published the infection rates of newspapers uh, in newspapers. And those hospitals that had higher infection rates looked bad in the newspaper. And they worked very hard because it was public and their infection rates dropped as well. So they could get down those infection rates. I mean, you can't get them down to zero, but you could get down those, those infection rates. And so that's one, three, and that reduces cost. You know, the infection rates increase cost if people get, besides they, they die, some of them. Uh, but the, but the, the infection rate itself increases cost. Another one is they're trying to get physician groups and hospitals to work together to contain cost. And so all over the country, we have formed the, what's called the accountable care organizations. These are called the accountable care organizations. And they work together, supposed to be to reduce cost. And if they reduce cost, they get a share of that reduction. Now, there's a ton of these now. There's a ton of these organizations that have been formed, but only a handful so far have been able to get this, um, this monetary incentive, but they say it's too soon to know. Uh, I mean, it's only, there, it's only been a couple years, uh, like two years or three years, uh, and until you got these accountable care organizations. Um, I don't know what's happening, but I do know that uh, uh, Marshfield Clinic had formed an accountable care organization with ministry at St. Joseph's Hospital in, in, in Marshfield. And uh, I, I, I also know that they were having a trouble with the hospital in trying to get down that that, that um, cost, not the infection rate, but this had to do with the cost. Uh, but there, but there, that is an accountable care, care organization uh, there. Anyway, those are ways of trying to get down cost. Uh, so, so, so whether cost will come down, who knows. But I mean, this is, this is the idea. But, but the federal government is not regulating. It would be state regulation. Some do and some don't. Yeah. Is the accountable care movement part of the metrics movement? We know it's now beginning to be brought into health care where physicians are being held accountable to the, the procedures and the prescriptions and the follow up. Well, that, that, that can be part of it too. Okay. Right, that can be part of the two. And, but, but you, know, it, you know, everything leads to something else. And so when you, there's a lot of that, that, that in there. But this increases the cost to medical organizations because physicians have to document much more than they did before. So there's that particular cost. And so a number of medical organizations are trying to deal with that issue. And they're dealing with that issue with uh, hiring scribes uh, that do some of the documentation. And Green Bay's got a, a number of those. And Marshall Clinic's got an experiment, which to the life of me, I can't see this really reducing cost. But in internal medicine, they are actually hiring nurses again. And the, I mean, people who have degrees in nursing, not medical assistants. Well they, well, they have the medical assistants. So, they're, so the medical assistant is still there. They're having a nurse and the physician. The physician is not going to spend any less time with the patient. But the purpose of the nurse is to do the documentation. So a lot of the documentation is being done by the nurse. That the nurse also gives the patient a lot of um, things, you know, like, like written things, like the doctor said to, to do this. So rather than just telling you, you actually get it on a piece of paper. And the nurse is then printing this out uh, for the patient. So it's not only in the file, but also, uh, also that. Uh, I asked how this is going to save money, the argument in terms of saving money, and the argument was that the doctor will be able to see more patients, even spending the same amount of time with the patient, because we'll, have, we'll reduce the, doc, the uh, cost of, of documenting it. 
but I'm not certain about the financing of that. But all of that is related to the document cost and quality. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, why are this, uh, some procedures in other countries uh, much, uh, much less expensive than the same procedures here? Because we pay a lot more for uh, physicians. Uh, we pay a lot more for hospitals uh, and so forth. And so in other countries, it's cheaper. So the industry is growing up of medical tourism. And so people are going to other countries to have these procedures. And there are certain uh, countries that are big American tourism ones. They have American-style hospitals. They have uh, board-certified physicians that are board-certified from the United States uh, boards uh, there. And the charges are, are, are much less. So there's a number of places. Uh, India's got some of them. The Paul's got some of them, and so forth. And in some cases, insurance companies are actually paying people to go there. So they're not only they're, they're not only they're not only paying for the procedure, but they're paying for the transportation cost, and they're also paying to take somebody with you. Uh, and uh, so insurance companies are paying because it's cheaper. It, it's cheaper for them. Yeah. yeah. I'm concerned about a uh, declining number of primary care physicians that are willing to take Medicare patients in the future. Right. And um, I have a suggestion for that as a consumer of health care. And that would be um, tie the renewal of a license for a medical doctor to the uh, requirement that they accept Medicare patients and if that was not good at a state level, the idea being, well, I'll take my practice and move out of your state if you're going to do that, I know it would be a big step, but as a consumer, it would be best if it was same nationwide. Instead of licensing at a state level, that would be a big adjustment, but that would sure be, from a consumer point of view, a good step in the right direction to have one license federally nationwide. Right. And what happened was that we did require, well there's not a license nationwide, but we did require uh, that, that, medic, that physicians take Medicare patients, they, uh, but there was, a, there was a major Republican move and that was so that people could opt out of Medicare. And that's more recent. What was happening is some physicians were seeing Medicare patients and illegally, it was illegal, they were making side agreements with the patient that they would pay, you know, more. And they thought that was okay, but it isn't. It wasn't. Okay, so what happened was that, uh, that uh, in the uh, medic, well, it happened a couple times, but particularly the one that put the drug benefits, called the Medicare Modernization Act in 2006. And this does allow physicians several options, but one is to opt out of Medicare. And if they opt out of Medicare, they can't do it for one patient, you know, say, oh, okay, I'm going to cover you, but not you. So they got to totally opt out of Medicare, and they can't go back in for two years. And so they can, they can, they can do that. And this has led to an increasing number of the concierge right. practices, uh, where they don't take Medicare, and they don't take insurance directly yeah. either. They have a lower patient load, and uh, they get, uh, the people are paying, you know, a flat sum you know, the year to be seen by, by that patient. Well, uh, I don't like that because yeah. there's a growing number of people like me that are just about right. to enter into right. and Medicare that, and like tomorrow okay. is that when I start. <laughs> yeah, well, you'll be okay tomorrow. Card, but you'll be okay around here. The, the big, in, big institutions yeah. are, uh, are taking it. But there is a, there, it isn't great. It isn't a great number. Uh, it but isn't, it's a it, but, 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 it, but, but, yeah, yeah, it is growing, but still small. The American Medical, American, uh, Medical Association says it says it's much larger than it is, according to uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid. I'll but keep it, my it, fingers crossed. But it is occurring. Uh, but, but you're right. You're right. Uh, um, uh, his colleague, <laughs> it is his colleague uh, in the English department, formerly in the English department, moved out west. And there's a big medical center out there. And oh, he's going to get his health care at that medical center and asked me to take a look at it. Well, you know, that medical center I initially thought was like Marshfield or something like that or ministry. And, but I found that it isn't. It's more like uh, an office facility. And each of the doctor units 
in that office facilities are all independently incorporated. So they're all, they're all independent in there. Well, if you look at those doctors, strangely enough, some take Medicare and some don't. And so if he's going there and he, you know, he's on Medicare, you know, he's got to look at which ones take it and which ones don't, because some do. So the, the cardiologist may take it in cardiology practice, but down the hall, the orthopedic practice does. Yeah. And so, so that, that was the most clear one I've ever seen within the same, same office building. But I know some primary care doctors who, who are not taking Medicare. Yeah. Uh, sure. Most specialists do. Uh, a lot of specialists do. The only ones that don't are a lot of them that are, that are like, th there's a guy, uh, it's written in the Wall Street Journal, he's a knee guy, and he's in Aspen, Colorado. And so he doesn't take Medicare because a lot of his patients, one, are not older, some of them are, but the fact is he charges a lot more, and he's not, he was not unwilling to take Medicare. He says, I'm great. <laughs> so he doesn't take it. But yeah, that's, that is an issue. That's just a that, that, is, that is an issue, and the, and, the, and the issue that Medicare is paying, uh, they're paying less. Right. There is no question they're paying less. I mean, you have a cataract procedure under 65, and your insurance company pays for it, that person will get a lot more from that cataract procedure than they will now for Medicare, right. from the Medicare. Yeah. Well, on, the other, you're on the other side, you know, there are people that have opted out of Medicare individuals. Then, when they need certain kinds of services, they can't find a doctor won't take them because they don't have Medicare. I actually know of a case that this happens. Oh, were they opted out of Medicare? They opted, yeah, they opted out of Medicare. And then when they needed some specialty care, they couldn't get it because even though they had it in their private insurance, the doctor wouldn't take it unless they had Medicare. Unless they had Medicare, so right. You kind of, can have the opposite, too. This right. Is, it's a pretty small number. Yeah, uh, well, they don't believe in it. It's usually the Unabomber. <laughs> As these guys describe it, or I have a colleague who, whose mother-in-law, uh, she was a, he was a colleague, he's dead now, I guess he's not a colleague, he used to be a colleague, but anyway, but, but his mother-in-law, I remember, hated the government, she lived in Illinois, she hated the government, and she didn't, she didn't take Part B, because Part B is optional. This you, is the mother of a former colleague. <laughs> but Part B is optional. But like 98 to 99 percent actually of people register for Part B. Uh, but that, that, that is an issue. Or a doctor won't see you who don't have insurance. You say, well, I don't have insurance, but I've got enough money, you know, I'm self-insured. The doctors may not, may not see you. Or the big one, of course, is, and that's the big one, is Medicaid. And there's lots of doctors who will not take, take Medicaid. In our local community, for example, in the dental area, there are no dentists that take Medicaid. Uh, so there's no dentists that take general Medicaid in there, which is the reason that ministry formed the, the dental clinic was because, because of that reason. But I mean, and, but on the other hand, in Wisconsin, the reimbursement rate for dental care is extremely low. It's one of the lowest in the country, like 49th in the, in the country. There's some experiments to see what would happen if we offered a little bit more money. So there is some experiments on some counties in Wisconsin. Yeah. Hospitals blame their costs, their price increases on their costs that are going up for equipment and for buildings and the insurance that they're forced to pay. The insurance companies say their prices are going up because their costs right. to insure. It, is anybody making more profit now than they were before? Everybody's making a profit. <laughs> so they're, all they're all making a profit. They're all making a profit. No. No, I think their, their profit has, has increased a bit, particularly, particularly, you know, like companies that make like uh, MRIs and that kind of stuff. Uh, th th those are significant profits. Uh, drug companies, uh, profits haven't gone up a lot, um, but what's happening with drug companies, this is a big fight, and this is the new pills that are coming out, these biologics. And there is no rhyme or reason that they should be priced at that rate, except for the fact is that they can get it, because this is the treatment for hepatitis C, and, and, and they can get it. So they've had a lot of fights with these drug companies about what they're pricing this drug at. And the original HIV drug was the same way. 
that was priced extremely high because it was, it was the only drug for HIV. And the fact is that a lot of the research that was done for that drug was done under federal grants. And so, so there was tremendous pressure. They ultimately, because of that political pressure, they actually dropped the price of that drug a bit. But the fact is right now we have these high prices and they're saying, can you justify the prices? That's what they're saying to these drug companies. They're saying, can you justify the prices? I mean, where's the justification? Show us where the research costs and so forth, lay it out. And they can't do it. There is no justification for those prices other than they can get it, that they can get it. They're a monopoly and they can get those prices uh, right now. Now, we're gonna see what happens to hepatitis C because, because there's a couple other ones coming out. Okay. Question, yeah. Okay, in re three things. In regard to what you're just talking about, these exotic pills, that every time you go to the doctor and there's something unusual, like my husband had a rare kind of leukemia. Right. And uh, the doctor offered to get the pills for my husband free for a year, those pills that he had taken, from, right. 24 every day, free from a drug company. Right. The, that one pill, would have cost $34,000 a year. Mm -hmm. And so they always ask, if you say, well, I don't know if I can afford it, the doctor will say they'll look into it and may possibly refer you to the drug company. They have programs that will help those who can't pay those exotic pills. Number two. That's true. They, they, all the drug companies have yeah. that. And many of the health institutions have now set up uh, uh, systems. That you can that you can go into that they will file the papers for you, uh, the, the the computer one. However, there's a limited uh, number that they give out of those, and it's based upon an individual's income and so forth. Uh, so there is a limit there, but overall they're making a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is, under you, you were talking about reasons for cost increases, and you talked about, uh, and your, your your talk is very informative, funny and full of really good facts. But you said with upcoding, now you have no, what statistics do you have on how many hospitals do upcoding? Oh, there's a, there's a lot of, up, they, there's, been, there's been lots of studies about upcoding. Okay. And, and, so and you didn't give any statistics Right, because I don't even know if the federal government has any statistics on the amount of upcoding, but when they've gone in and they've audited a number of the hospitals, they have found uh, where they can find upcoding uh, that has occurred. And so there's a number of actual prosecutions that have been brought on the, on, on the basis of, of, of upcodings. Is uh, this that you gave an overview so it sounded like everybody did? Well, no, not necessarily. But what happens is, and this is what, what, what has happened is, the, one of the things that happened is the diagnostic related groups which is what they, what Medicare bases it upon. The DRGs, which are what your diagnosis is, have been expanding. And so they've increased the number of sub-diagnostic groups. And for each of the diagnostic groups is a certain amount of money that then is then paid to the hospital. And so when you have multiple diagnostic groups, you wind up saying, well, is it this or is it this? And they wind up coding it uh, a higher amount, a higher amount. And Everybody knows that that goes on, basically. But the question is, is it being done in a fraudulent way? Right. And there are hospitals and hospital systems that have been investigated in which there's been, uh, you know, there's been indictments that brought against a systematic upcoding. But there's been a lot of discussion of upcoding. A lot of discussion about upcoding. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of upcoding that occurs. Uh, um, you know, and, and you, you know, people could dispute it. They say, well, it's not upcoded. You know, uh, you know, whether it's a medium-sized visit or a short visit, you know. Uh, how many people have had short visits, do you know, to the doctor? The only way you get a short visit to the doctor is if you ran, uh, ran into them in cops. <laughs> and so they, those codes are not given. <laughs> those codes are not given. <laughs> Uh, not that they're upcoding, but I mean, you know, that's a 10 minute visit is considered uh, whatever it is, a medium visit, you know, on the code. Uh, and that's, 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 that's what, is, what has occurred. Uh, the other thing is that, that, you know, there's some interesting question about the prices in general. And now federal government does control some of the prices, uh, but in terms of Medicare. But in prices in general, we are higher in this local area. 
uh, we have higher prices here, uh, and uh, it, it, uh, there was one the other day that they looked at. Madison, Milwaukee have higher prices nationally. They did. We weren't included. It was the metropolitan areas, and Mad I was surprised at Madison. And the reason I was surprised at Madison is there's a lot of competition in Madison. And if you look at the state insurance in Madison, the state insurance in Madison costs less than the state insurance in many places in, in the state, you know, like here. And the, and the reason the argument is is that because of the competition, their prices have been kept, their prices have been kept down in Madison. But this national study showed that their prices were high in Madison. And I know there's issues with university hospitals and clinics in Madison because there's another organization in Madison that have stopped sending their patients in Madison to university hospitals and clinics. And what they've done is for very complicated cases, they have made a deal with uh, Freydick in Milwaukee. So rather than sending the patients to university hospitals and clinics, which is uh, less than a mile away, uh, they're sending them to Milwaukee. And the reason is because they say uh, their, their costs are less than university hospitals and clinics. So, so but, but when we get the medic, okay, with Medicare, I should point out, even though Medicare controls the, what they pay out, the payout of Medicare differs in different, different regions. So what they pay in, in Wisconsin is different than Medicare will pay for the same service in Florida, in Florida. Now, Senator Cole, was major pressure on this to try to get rid of those because he says the cost in Wisconsin is not that much different than the cost in Florida. They're buying things nationally. They have to compete nationally for doctors and other, other people and so forth. The land may be a little cheaper, but other than that, the costs are about the same. So they have narrowed. He was able to get it narrowed. He was the head of the Committee on the Aging. And he did get it narrowed, but it's still there is a different payment. So if you have a cataract in Wisconsin and you have a cataract in Florida, Medicare will pay more for the cataract in Florida. Uh, so uh, Wisconsin is a different than Thank you very much.